And the second really is from Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 42, and that's on page 1097 of the Church Bible. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and they began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported. We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God had exalted him to his right hand as prince and saviour that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this they were furious and wanted to put put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honoured by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared claiming to be somebody and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, You will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. 
day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Brilliant, Phil. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I thought we would uh, have a bit of a, a driving theory test. Good. So what's that one? Nice, easy one to get started with. Progestion crossing. Excellent. Good. Good. Let's go for the next one. Good. Men at work. Men at work. <laughs> could be. Could be. Yeah. Crossroads. Crossroads. Good. Next one. Let's go for the next one. Is it? Is it men at work? Or is it it's about to rain? He's getting his umbrella out. Like, you know, which one is it? Good, let's, let's keep going, wonderful, because sometimes they're a bit more they're like, yeah, that's my driving, by the way. Uh, good, wonderful, yeah, yeah, wonderful. Go for the next one. Good, ooh. This is from India, apparently. A ferry crossing, a ferry crossing, for a car ferry crossing to get across the river. There you go. Good. Yes, and sometimes road signs are a bit more crazy uh, and ridiculous, aren't they? And yeah, to go for the next one as well, that'd be lovely. Thank you so much. Now, what is that one about? Yes, if you're on a tractor or a bike or a horse, you can't ride here, is basically what it's saying. That's uh, from uh, Israel, I gather. Good, I think there's a couple more. Brilliant. (laughs) That was in Scotland. (laughs) And there we go. Road signs. You know, I think we have uh, different views about road signs. Sometimes we we follow them religiously. Uh, Other times we just go, well, I think I know better than that. And there was a time recently, I was with my family, We'd been on a three-hour car journey, and uh, Satnav said to go down this track. It was a shortcut uh, to get uh, to avoid the traffic. Uh, And there was a no-entry sign. I said, don't worry, love, it'll be fine, darling, don't worry, we'll keep on going. Uh, And uh, and then it said a dead end, and I I ignored it, thinking, no, 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 I know better than this. And the road was wide, and then it went narrower, and then from tarmac it went to sort of gravel, sort of like loose stuff. Uh, And then we passed quite a few people riding bikes, uh, and quite a few people walking uh, and said don't worry darling it's fine look don't worry kids like you know just keep going keep going another hour and then sorry another um, mile and a half uh, down the track lo and behold it was a dead end and then I had to do a 12 point turn because it was so narrow and I was in the estate and we had to turn around and then pass all the people uh, who we had uh, uh, walk, driven past who are walking and cycling in a beautiful countryside we do that don't we sometimes we think we know better and I wonder whether we ever do that with God we think uh, that we know better and yet We see in our reading, in verse 29 there, the apostles, we must obey God rather than human beings. They were sticking to God first. Uh, The book of Acts is is the story of the the church. Jesus Christ has died on the cross, uh, risen and ascended, and he's given the great commission to the disciples, the apostles, to share this good news uh, of the Lord Jesus. And it starts in Jerusalem, and then it goes through to Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. This good news of Jesus Christ spreading out uh, across the nation and nations. And these are sort of unusual times in many ways. But yet we see themes of the gospel being shared and explained. And of what it means to look and to live for the Lord Jesus first. And so we see the apostles saying, no, 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 we are going to stick to God first. We're going to stick to God first. And they've been put in prison. Uh, and uh, an angel of the Lord says, no, no, no. Well, you need to be out there telling the people about Jesus. So, so I'll, I'll get you out of prison. And then they don't then go into hiding. Think, great, we've now got out of prison. They go back to the temple. They start telling people about Jesus. They then get, get called in again uh, by the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And uh, they're trying to find a way to, 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 to kill them. But they said, no, we've got to keep on going. We've got to keep on telling people this good news of Jesus, uh, the Messiah. Even after they've been flogged and threatened again, they don't give up. They keep on going. They're not not interested in wanting to listen to what the Pharisees say, but they want to stick to God and what God has for them to do. We must obey God rather than human beings. And so they went on teaching and proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus. Why? Why did they do that? It was so costly for them. And indeed, it would be even more costly with many of them having to give their lives uh, as a result. But yet they did it. Why do they do that? Why were they so adamant about obeying God rather than human beings? Well, three reasons. 
uh, that we see in our passage. Uh, the first one uh, is there uh, in verse uh, 30 to 32. And it's all about God's way. If we could have the next slide, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Uh, God's, uh, God's way. And uh, the next slide again. Thank you. And God's way is God's saving way. God's saving way. Uh, verse 29 again. We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you have killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. It's God's saving way. That he saves us through the blood of Jesus Christ at the cross and gives forgiveness and new life. God of, the, uh, of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. Verse 31, God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel, God's people, to repentance and forgiveness of sins. To, forgive, to give forgiveness for the ways he stuffed up and got things wrong. It's a wonderful story of Thomas Edison who invented uh, the, the light bulb and uh, uh, the, the, when the, um, the first light bulbs were being made, it took 24 hours for each light bulb to be made and 24 hours a whole team of men uh, were, were making a light bulb and they gave it to the young, the young boy and the young boy put the light bulb on the tray and, and took it uh, up the flight of stairs uh, to the storeroom and lo and behold, you can guess what happened, smash, the bulb fell on the floor, the boy uh, came back. 24 hours passed, light bulb was put into his, into his hands, onto his tray, and it was taken up to the room. Forgiveness. And it's the forgiveness that the Lord gives. As Jesus, with arms outstretched at the cross, it is finished. All is taken, all the ways that we have stuffed up, all the ways that we have failed, all the ways that we fall short. All of the guilt that we have on our hearts and lives, knowing how we have not lived for the Lord first how we have not obeyed God, are forgiven and taken. That it's no longer sin and judgment, but it's forgiveness and life that is given by the Lord Jesus. And it's that forgiveness to know. It's that forgiveness to delight in, uh, to live uh, in the light of. Uh, Some years ago, when I was at a theological college in uh, North London, uh, I was uh, hanging out uh, with some friends of ours, and they, at the time, had a small boy uh, called Peter, and Peter was quite a bouncy sort of chap. He was age three or four at the time. And I was round at their house, out the front of the house with some other friends as well. And Peter grabbed hold of the back hold of my trousers onto the pocket of my trousers and was sort of swinging around. Uh, and his mum and dad said, Peter, stop that now. Peter, stop that. Did Peter stop? No. And he kept on going. And sort of like he pulled even more and sort of swung around laughing and laughing. Uh, and, and Peter, stop. Peter, really stop. And... <laughs> You can imagine what happened next. Literally, my pocket was ripped off from my belt down to my knee, boxer shorts and everything uh, on show. Peter was taken in uh, by his parents and uh, spoken to. And uh, another friend uh, gave me some trousers. He was a half a foot shorter than me, so I spent the rest of the day walking around like that. Later that afternoon, I went for a walk with Peter and his mum and dad. Peter came out, eyes full of tears, very sad, and knowing he'd got it wrong, and said, Hutch, I'm really sorry, please forgive me. Don't worry, Peter, it's fine, let's go for a walk. And so we went for a walk, and I walked through some woods uh, uh, near the college, and there was a big old tree that had fallen down in a storm, and he walked along the, the, the tree trunk, and he got to the end of the tree trunk, and he looked up at his dad, his eyes still uh, full of tears and remorse for how he had got it wrong. Uh, and he looked up, uh, and his dad, Mark, was there with arms open. And his eyes, Peter's eyes, from tears of sorrow to eyes of delight, unforgiven, and he jumps into his father's arms. That is the forgiveness that the Lord gives through the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And it's the forgiveness we need. It's the forgiveness we need to be saved from death and judgment and given life and eternal life. Now, I'm told uh, there were five lists, five categories of passengers uh, on board Uh, who sat on board the fateful uh, journey of the Titanic, royalty and government government ministers, film stars, the famous, millionaires, first-class passengers and steerage. As far as I'm aware, after the Titanic sunk, there were just two lists, known to be saved, known to be lost. Yet this is God's saving way. It's God's saving way in giving repentance and forgiveness. 
And it's not just God's saving way. That's not the only reason. It's also God's promised way. Uh, Back in verse 30 again, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross, or more literally, tree. Uh, Which goes back to Deuteronomy, that the judgment for uh, sin will be taken by a man uh, on a tree, Jesus on the cross. Uh, Our reading from Zechariah uh, was speaking about uh, the forgiveness that is given. And that has been a promised thing. It's not new. It's not a new plan that God's come up with, but it's the old plan. It's the original plan, knowing that he had before the beginning of time, knowing that he was going to give his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, at the cross. And our theme verse for today, uh, verse 42, day after day, in the temple courts, from house to house, they never stop teaching, proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one. The one who God gives and promised he would give to save. See, God's promise, it isn't fickle. It's not changing. It's not uh, uh, held lightly. But it's the greatest promise he has ever given of the hugest significance. So it's God's way. It's God's saving way. It's God's promised way. And it's God's unstoppable way. Because nothing will stop. God's work and will being done. The Pharisees, uh, as we uh, read in our passage, they're wondering about what to do and how can they they kill Jesus. And uh, a wise uh, Pharisee among them, Gamaliel, said, hang on a second, hang on a second. Just think about this. Look, let's just think what's happened before uh, with other similar uprisings and what's happened. And he gave two examples uh, of uh, previous uprisings. One of Thaddeus, the other one of uh, uh, of, uh, Judah, the Galilee. Uh, uprisings that they started. And for this, he, um, he uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, Gamalian, Gamalian uh, he concluded, look, if it's, if it's just another thing, it will just die out. It won't last. But, verse 39, if it is from God, they will not be able to stop these men. God's plan, it's unstoppable. God's way is unstoppable. Nothing can stop it. It's like you're surfing in Cornwall uh, and a big wave comes in. You can't stop the wave. You're going to, unless you ride it properly, you're going to get taken right up onto the beach on it. King Canute, he couldn't control the tides. He couldn't control the waters coming in. God is unstoppable. It's God's saving way, God's forgiving way, God's unstoppable way. And so the apostles' response is, we obey God first. We look to God first. We trust in God first. And not only that, they delight in that. Verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of the suffering of having just been flogged. Uh, Rejoicing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How does that look then for us? How does it look for us to be putting God first in our hearts and in our lives. Imagine you have a painting, a painting of your life, and everything of, on your life, of your life is on that painting. It's a, big, it's a big bit of canvas, you know, so you've got your family, and you've got your job, and you've got your hobbies, your interests, your passions, uh, what you like, your, the kind of books you like to read, the films you like to watch, the music you like to listen to, everything is on this canvas. Uh, where is God on that canvas? Is he there? And at the center of the canvas is what is most important to us, what is most dear. And where is God? Because for the apostles, God would be front and center in the canvas of their lives. And may that be for us, that we not listen to the ways of the world of how we should live, but we look to God first, and that be our framework for how we navigate life and look to, uh, look to God And live in the light of the salvation and forgiveness that he gives. Making the most of every opportunity we have to speak and to share the good news of the risen Jesus. Let me pray uh, before uh, we sing again. Lord God, thank you so much for your saving and your promised and unstoppable way. Thank you that you are the sovereign Lord of all that you have a plan and that you will bring your plan to fruition. 
Thank you, Father, that you don't look on us in despair, but you look on us in mercy and in forgiveness. And help us, Lord, seek to know that forgiveness for ourselves and to live in the light of that forgiveness and of the resurrected life that you give us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy on us. And Lord, help us to have you at the center of our hearts and the center of our lives, that we, like the apostles, Lord, would rejoice daily in knowing the life that we have in you. And Lord, that we'd seek to do your will and to do your way first. And please, Lord, help us to see what that looks like in our hearts and lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand to sing uh, our next uh, song, The Great Hope We Have uh, in Jesus, the King of Kings. Let's stand to sing.